once again in 1973, the Fighting Irish of Notre Dame gained the ultimate heights in college football, being named the national champions. It was a season to remember, and there were many stars to be remembered, like defensive back and safety man Mike Townsend. He led the nation as the best interceptor in 1972 as a junior, and his very presence in the secondary as a senior prevented passes being thrown by the opposition. Mike was a native of Hamilton, Ohio, who was guided in his life by his mother. He felt so much affection toward her that when others took wives and girlfriends to the Hula Bowl in Honolulu, Mike took his mom. Tight end Dave Casper will go down as one of the greatest tight ends ever to play college football. He was described by athletic director Moose Kraus as the greatest and most inspirational captain in the history of Notre Dame football. His coach, Era Parsegian, claimed that Casper had the best pair of hands he'd ever seen. He certainly was the most versatile athlete ever to play at Notre Dame. In one season, he was a guard, a tackle, he was the punter on the team, and also the tight end. With Casper leading the way, Notre Dame recorded a perfect 11-0 season, climaxing it with a dramatic win over Alabama in the Sugar Bowl, 24-23. Dave Casper went on to star with the Oakland Raiders and was selected at the end of the decade as the NFL's first team tight end of the 70s. He began the new decade with the Houston Oilers. A player destined for stardom the moment he set foot on the campus at USC was wide receiver Lynn Swan. He became an All-America college player and then went on to star with the Pittsburgh Steelers. Seldom has college football seen a more determined athlete or a more versatile one. Whatever he was asked to do, he was the best there was in 73. Watch him block here. He single-handedly annihilates two men. Swan led the Trojans in receiving, and in 1973 became their all-time pass-receiving leader with 95 catches and 11 touchdowns. Swan's desire to get the ball into the end zone was almost an obsession. He would not be denied. Roger Staubach's successor as quarterback of the Dallas Cowboys was Danny White, an All-America quarterback for Arizona State in 1973. He actually went to Arizona State as a baseball star, even though 23 years before, his father, Wilford, had led the nation in rushing and was a first-team Little All-America player. Danny became a master at picking opponents apart. He threw the football just about as accurately as he did a baseball. Some of his records still stand at ASU. Most touchdown passes, 59. Most yards, 5,932. And no less than five NCAA passing records that he set are still intact, seven years after Danny White had left the campus. There was, in 1973, a defensive nose guard by the name of Lucius Selman, who is described to this day by veteran Oklahoma football observers as the best ever to play for the Sooners. He was the first of three brothers to play for Oklahoma. The other two who followed were Dewey and Leroy. During his collegiate career, the Sooners won 32 out of their 35 games. He returned to his alma mater in 1976 to become defensive line coach. And along about 1993, looked for another Selman, his son Lucius III, to be wearing the colors of Oklahoma. For boundless enthusiasm, it was hard to match 258-pound tackle John Hicks of Ohio State, one of the best for tough, close-in blocking for the quarterback. Look at this hole. But what John Hicks really delighted in was cutting a swath through the defensive line so the Buckeye backs like Archie Griffin could go roaring through on the way to the end zone. Hicks was so effective and so dominating that he was voted both the Outland and Lombardi trophies in 1973 as the nation's top lineman. With Hicks on that Big Ten and championship Rose Bowl team was All-America linebacker Randy Gratishaw. A trademark of his was that he never left any part of his job unfinished. 
Ball carriers took his full force when he hit them. And oftentimes, he shocked them into a fumble. But what pleased Ohio State fans most was when Gratishar would simply bury an opponent. The University of Missouri boasted one of the nation's top defensive backs in 73, a walk-on by the name of John Mosley, 5'9", 162, who specialized in punt returns. Just watch this remarkable run. You'll understand why his coach, Al Anafrio, called him the grittiest player he ever saw. Despite being stopped six times in this run against SMU, he returned it 74 yards, one of the greatest runbacks ever in college football. The 1973 Coach of the Year was Johnny Majors, who gave Pittsburgh their first winning season in a decade. Here was a man who truly loved what he was doing. I love my business. It's a great profession, and uh, uh, I find that young men frequently will do a great job of getting me back off the canvas, so to speak, when my daubers are down, my chin's on the ground. And uh, this is great to go back on to a practice field with Tuesday with 18 to 21 year old young men who will not be defeated and will have the enthusiasm back. And that's one reason I like this business very much. I've been around it all my life. and I hope that I continue to stay in a few years because I thoroughly love it. The 1973 Heisman Trophy winner was John Capaletti, tailback on the unbeaten, untied Penn State team. The only player from that school to win the award. His season's average of 120 yards per game is still a Penn State high, and it was the reason the Nittany Lions were able to post a perfect 12-0 record. Capaletti was the number one draft choice of the Los Angeles Rams, later became a valuable running back for the San Diego Chargers. During his senior year, he was able to produce under pressure during the heart of the season when the schedule was toughest. Against North Carolina State, he scored the winning touchdown in a six-point victory. He rushed for more than 200 yards, and on the road against Maryland, he controlled the ball and the clock for another 200-yard performance. At the Heisman Award dinner, he spoke with only the aid of a few notes on the back of an envelope. It was one of the most moving moments in the long history of that award, as he dedicated the trophy to his 11-year-old brother, Joey, who was suffering from leukemia. I think a lot of people think um, that I go through a lot on Saturdays and during the week, as most of the athletes do. You get your bumps and bruises, and it's a, a terrific battle out there in the field. And it, but it only for me, it's on Saturdays, and it's only in the fall. For Joseph, it's all year round, and it's a battle that's unending with him, and he puts up with much more than I'll ever put up, and I think that this trophy is more of his than his mine, because he's been a great inspiration to me. In April of 1975, Joey passed away, but he had had some glorious experiences in his short lifetime, thanks to his older brother, John. Seventy-four didn't start out all that well for the eventual national champions, the Trojans of Southern California. They lost their opening game to Arkansas, but they were perfect from there on. They climaxed the season with a victory in the Rose Bowl. Much of the Trojan success could be credited to this man, Anthony Davis, right out of the tailback mold of Mike Garrett and O.J. Simpson. No two parts of A.D.'s body are ever moving in the same direction at the same time. A mighty tough target. In 1974, he led the Pac-10 Conference in both rushing and in scoring. Anthony Davis became the most celebrated kickoff returner in the history of college football. Remember this one? USC was down 24-6 to to Notre Dame at halftime. Davis took this second-half kickoff two yards deep in his own end zone. 
he turned on his tremendous acceleration. He left the members of the Notre Dame team in his wake. He was like the tail of a flying kite. This was the play that lit the fuse that blew Notre Dame apart with the greatest avalanche of points ever to engulf an Irish team. In that third quarter, the Trojans scored 41 points on their way to a smashing 55-24 victory in a national championship. AD's kneecap shuffle in the end zone was a touchdown ritual that SC fans will never forget. Harvard had its first All-America player in 34 years in 1974. Split end Pat McAnally made the squad. This ex-high school quarterback from California came to Harvard with the intention of playing basketball. Instead, he became the greatest receiver in Harvard history and a Rhodes Scholar finalist. McAnally came up with the most spectacular catches of the entire season. No matter where the ball was thrown, it seems, he was able to grab it and hang on to it, like this. Harvard climaxed his final game with its biggest victory in a quarter of a century, coming from behind to defeat undefeated Yale 21 to 16. Pat McAnally's outstanding punting ability enabled him to continue his career in professional football as a punter for the Cincinnati Bengals. Maryland still refers to defensive tackle Randy White as its best player ever. The Terrapins won the ACC title when he was a senior. White represented a new breed of player who used weights to develop his body strength. He played at 238. In his senior year, he could bench press 430 pounds, up 170 pounds from when he started as a freshman. White specialty, one that he worked on constantly in practice, was blocking punts, and he became an expert. Randy White won the Outland Trophy as the nation's best interior lineman, and then he continued his football career with the Dallas Cowboys. Pat Thomas of Texas A&M was just about as tough a 180-pounder as you'll ever find. He just loved to hit. He was the big play man for the Aggies during his four years on the squad. He was really tough in the secondary. Get the ball near him, and he'll come down with it. He was an all-state running back at Plano High School who had great quickness. How's this for quick thinking? And then great reaction against Rice, grabbing a deflected ball in midair, and then racing 33 yards for the touchdown. Pat Thomas continued his football career with the L.A. Rams. Quarterback Tom Clements came to Notre Dame when he was only 18 years old. He matured into a masterful tactician. He became only the third Notre Dame quarterback to be named team captain. He started every game for three years, and he led the Irish to a 29-5 record, including the 1973 National Championship and that 24-23 victory in the Sugar Bowl over Alabama. Number 24, Joe Washington of Oklahoma, was the absolute textbook example of the true scat back. Barry Switzer, his coach, called him a Houdini type of runner, the fastest man in the world at 15 yards. Coach Darrell Royal of Texas said Washington could go through a keyhole like smoke. In 1974, Joe Washington broke open the Oklahoma State game with this spectacular punt return. Just watch it. He's caught on the sidelines. No way to get out. Wrong. Out he pops, escaping down the sidelines, on his way to one of 14 touchdowns that he scored during that year. The 1974 Coach of the Year was Grant Taff of Baylor, giving the Bears their first Southwest Conference championship in 50 years and a berth in the Cotton Bowl. Archie Griffin became a legend at Ohio State in the 70s. He won two Heisman trophies in the decade. There may have been players who were faster or scored more points or who were more spectacular than Archie Griffin, but there never has been a player more durable or able to drain that last inch out of a play like he could do. a game because of an injury. He weighed 184 pounds and he never varied a pound from year to year. He had 31 consecutive games in which he ran for more than 100 yards. And late in the Purdue game in his senior year, he broke Ed Marinero's career rushing record, which he held until Tony Dorsett came along. At the Heisman ceremony, 
Archie's family and coach heard his sincere acceptance speech. Football for me has meant meeting people and making new friends that will last a lifetime. It has meant learning to work with other people to achieve a common goal using teamwork. Teamwork isn't a very big word. Believe me, without it, none of us stands a chance in life. Football has meant learning to accept life. In athletic competition, you learn to accept both success and failure. And if you can do that, you're definitely ready to make a significant contribution in society today. If today's young people look up to the Heisman Trophy winner the way I did when I was a boy, I promise you, I will do everything in my power to be the greatest example. Thank you. And Archie Griffin continued to set examples for young people as a professional with the Cincinnati Bengals. Of all the entertaining halftime features that occur in college football, the dance routine by the USC Song Girls was one of the most refreshing we've seen. And after one time through, we'll give them a new electronic look for their encore. proclaimed the 1975 national champion. The Sooners had another powerful defense anchored by the third of the Selman brothers, All-America tackle Leroy, who followed Lucius and played on the same team as Dewey. At 256 pounds, Leroy was so strong that just a glancing blow from his big paw often knocked opponents to the ground. Oklahoma was 11-1 on the season, including a victory over the University of Michigan in the Orange Bowl. The Wolverines found out what it was like to feel the Selman Crunch. The offensive power was supplied by Joe Washington, who climaxed a brilliant four-year career with the Sooners by running for a total of 3,995 yards through four seasons. Those numbers are likely to remain an Oklahoma record for some time. Washington was a colorful player who painted his shoes silver and not since Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz has a pair of shoes been more famous as they carried the magical feet of Joe Washington to some unbelievable runs. He carried his many talents into professional ball and at the beginning of the new decade was a starting running back with the Baltimore Colts. 1975 was a significant year for Tony Dorsett. He made the All-America team for the third year. It was also significant for Marty Akins of Texas, who became college football's first triple option quarterback to be named to the All-America squad. For three years, he started for coach Darrell Royal, and he was able to carry out the intricacies of the wishbone to its fullest, with that split-second timing needed to react to what the defense was doing. He had to be a strong runner, capable of maneuvering behind the line, but he also had to be able to throw accurately when the situation dictated a pass. Throughout his career, Marty Akins had to take a lot of punishment and a lot of hard shots. At times, it looked like he was running for his very life. He never had any pro aspirations. All he wanted to do was play for Texas. During his three years, the Longhorns won two Southwest Conference titles and were runners-up once. Today, he's an attorney in Houston. 
For three seasons, Tony Dorsett of Pitt gained more than 1,000 yards. And in 1975, it became obvious that he was within striking distance of Archie Griffin's all-time rushing record if he could stay healthy. Although 1975 was a winning season for Pitt, with an 8 and 4 mark, it wasn't as good as what the Panthers and Dorsett were capable of. And we'll see that when we come to 1976, Pitt's and Tony's greatest years. Keep in mind that Dorsett had been named two years before as the first freshman All-America player in 29 years. It seemed that after every performance, he got an affectionate hug from his coach, Johnny Majors. Chuck Muncy of California was about as loose a player as ever played in the Pac-10 Conference. And how did he get his name, Chuck Muncy? My real name is Harry Vance Muncy. And uh, like when I was born, my brothers didn't like my name, Harry. and. Uh, so they, they came out and they said, well, we'll call him Chuck. And ever since I can remember, I've been called Chuck. So, you know, that's what I go by. <laughs> All my official cards, I put Harry. But uh, as far as people know me, you know, my name is Chuck Muncy. When he was eight years old, Chuck Muncy was run over by a tractor trailer. It broke his arms, his legs, and his collarbone. Doctors were pessimistic about his chances of even walking normally. But after spending six weeks in a body cast and four months recuperating, he began the long road back. How well he accomplished it can be seen in the record books. He became California's greatest ball carrier, rewriting the record set nearly a quarter of a century ago by Johnny Olszewski. After a somewhat turbulent career with New Orleans, he began the 80s with San Diego. The leading rusher of 1975 was Ricky Bell of USC, often described as a linebacker playing tailback. He prepared for the season by running two miles each day on the beach in soft sand, wearing combat boots. Although he played the same position as O.J. Simpson, his style was far different. Where O.J. had finesse, Ricky Bell just overpowered people in his relentless, aggressive, forward-moving style of running. As it turned out, the Liberty Bowl of 1975 was Coach John McKay's final game with the Trojans. And it was one of Ricky Bell's most spectacular games. This 76-yard touchdown romp with a pass is still a Liberty Bowl record. McKay's admiration for Ricky Bell was obvious. One of the coach's first desires at Tampa was to get Ricky Bell. And so after Ricky's final season at USC, he became the number one draft choice of the Buccaneers. Reunited with his coach. In 1975, Archie Griffin became the first player in history to win the Heisman Trophy two years in a row. The all-time leading rusher at Ohio State credited his coach, Woody Hayes, with his own success. This was Archie's run against Purdue, which enabled him to break Ed Marinero's NCAA career rushing record. Play stopped. He was congratulated by everybody. And he was carried off the field on the shoulders of his teammates. Later, the officials gave him the game ball. His coach, Woody Hayes, was named Coach of the Year for the third time in his career. Before the unfortunate Gator Bowl incident, which forced his early retirement from football, Woody's 28 years at Ohio State produced 13 Big Ten titles and three national championships. We only have two rules on the squad. You know what they are? First one is no haters, black or white. No haters, we won't have it. And number two, no drugs. And that's just it, no drugs. If a fellow is on drugs and he's uh, legally found to be so, he's off and he knows it. Because the day that people can talk around and say, well, Woody lets them get by with it, it's all over. Because a lot of people don't use it because they realize that there are certain people that still have certain stops. We just don't go for it. But those are the two rules we have, no haters and no drugs. There was another All-America player from Ohio State in 1975 who deserves mention, defensive back Tim Fox. He was the cornerstone of the Buckeye defensive secondary, which allowed only one touchdown per game. No moment will be remembered as long as this one against Illinois when he returned an intercepted pass for a touchdown. And then because he was tired of seeing players doing dances in the end zone, he did a front flip to celebrate the occasion. Fox continued his career in professional football with the New England Patriots. 